Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to our uh, to our Lou with August Cole. Um, the robot made me do it, which is, has to be one of the best titles ever. Um, I love the title. Um, and uh, um, Mr. Cole has a very long uh, and uh, fabulous biography, which I'm not going to read, but I am putting his website uh, into chat if you would like to look at this really cool uh, website. Um, August is a, is a noted author, uh, especially co-author with P.W. Singer. Uh, many of us are familiar with the Ghost Fleet. A book which was wide, widely popular and wildly popular, especially in military circles. Um, but they're also uh, part of a broader um, sort of, uh, I guess, movement, I would say, um, around the idea of useful fiction, uh, thinking about how can we use fiction to inform uh, policy um, and other sorts of uh, debates. And as a philosopher myself, by the way, um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Pauline Shanks Corinne, and I serve as the Stockdale Chair in Professional Military Ethics in the College of Leadership and Ethics. And so fiction is near and dear to my heart as a part of the humanities and helping us think about human nature and, and questions of ethics. Um, I read Burnin this summer, and I, I have to confess, I am not like a sci-fi fantasy kind of person. Um, and so I read it with some, I was like, oh, what if I don't like this? But I just loved the book so much. Um, I think it's because of the main character, really. Um, but there are also lots of great philosophical and ethical themes in the book, uh, which are super interesting. So we are super lucky to have um, August here as part of our leadership and ethics series. Um, which will continue tomorrow with um, Dr. Christian Miller talking about honesty. Uh, but this is a chance and a space for us to talk about questions ar around leadership and ethics. So August is going to talk for a few minutes um, and that part of the session will be recorded. And then we will open it up to questions and discussion. I am going to moderate that, uh, that piece of, uh, of our conversation. So if you have questions, you can certainly come off mic and ask a question, um, but it's also helpful if you can put your question into chat so I can just sort of direct traffic a little bit. Um, so, um, so without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to August Cole. Thanks for being here, August. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you for the invitation, and it's a, a pleasure to uh, connect with the group. Um, the you know the interest in fiction. Uh, writ large, thankfully, is growing uh, for its relevance in, you know, the defense and security communities. And so my hope is that, you know, this sort of a, of a talk can be uh, of use to you in the in the ways that you think about not just the present, but of course, uh, the the future. Now, the, the talk I'm going to share screen here in a minute and, uh, and kind of walk you through, I have like, you know, essentially 17 slides or so. And uh, what that's going to do is bring some visuals to the, the way I'm going to be talking about not just the book Burn In uh, that was mentioned, but kind of how uh, and why uh, I feel like this is a really good way to think about the present, like I said, but also the future. There we go. So uh, many of you, of course, know Red Storm Rising. This is a book that I read, you know, literally when it came out. And it was so successful, I think, at the time in helping me as a, as a young kid growing up in Seattle, really thinking through uh, you know, what the unthinkable might actually look like, you know, a third world war with the Soviet Union. You know, I'd always been interested in diplomacy and, and military affairs and, and photography and things like that as they, as they related to trying to understand what was going on. Uh, and yet no one until, you know, Clancy's book had really stitched together, I think, a narrative that uh, was both realistically, you know, researched, but also, you know, bound up in this fairly, uh, you know, conventional thriller story. And, and so, you know, fast forward to 2015 when, when Peter Singer and I released Ghost Fleet, it was a coda in a way, I think, to the, the journey that I'd been on, a, 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 you know, a, a journey that started uh, with me, you know, really thinking that history was a great way to understand, you know, what was, uh, you know, the, the kind of arc uh, in the 90s of the, of the kind of the American experiment and its role in the global stage. Journalism then became my more immediate focus because I didn't want to sit in libraries. And so I spent a lot of time uh, working in financial news for marketwatch.com, really at the cutting edge of like the disruption of the news business. 
And then that led to the Wall Street Journal after graduate school. And yet, you know, I got to the journal um, in uh, in 2007 and working in DC reporting on uh, defense industry, intelligence contracting, uh, things like that, and, and realized that I kept wanting to write about what was going to happen. And for me, I think that became such a powerful force in my own mind, and as well as the transformation of the news business, uh, that I realized that I had to leave like this, this career that I had really been invested in emotionally. I love the service side of it. Uh, I love the, the kind of exploration that we're you know, allowed to, to undertake as a, as a serious reporter. And so I applied all that energy into fiction. And, and what I really found was that the same skills in reporting in connecting with an audience that you know could be like it is at the journal when you're writing a front page story. You know the CEO of a company, but also like you know to your parents uh, about the issues of the day, and and so the the journey then became one of trying to figure out how to do that. And so like a lot of writers, I have a manuscript that's like on my hard drive that never got published. Uh, it helped me get an agent after a couple of years of trying. It was a long journey, and and the reason why I'm, I'm talking about this this backstory is that because it's a very circuitous path that a lot of people have in trying to figure this out. Moreover, that there's no clear defined, uh, you know, almost algorithmic way to, to you know, make a, a path in the, in the kind of world of being a futurist, uh, especially one that wants to use fiction. It's sort of a, an experimental or, or prototyped uh, approach. But what that un, unsold manuscript allowed me to do was team up with uh, Peter Singer. And both of us had read Red Storm Rising, and both of us had been affected by, I think, the really interesting combination, again, of fact and fiction that, that Clancy had done. And yet we wanted to think about some of the other aspects of the national security environment that weren't being looked at, you know, back in 2013, when we kind of first started to link up on this. And the big question that we felt wasn't being talked about enough was China. And this was, of course, not a, you know, 2012 really is when we started 2013, you know, not a popular time to be talking about this. But yet we felt like it was important enough based on the trend lines that we were seeing that we would you know, undertake a project that, that became ghostly to do it in a fictional way. And yet, you know, take Clancy's legacy uh, and really push it in a way that allowed us to develop uh, a narrative that reflected the realities of war in the 21st century. So space and cyber, you know, how the book starts, uh, you know, unconventional warfare, guerrilla warfare, you know, are, are features, but yet told from an American point of view is with uh, U.S. insurgents and Chinese occupation. We looked at like the role of anonymous, the role of uh, space privateers. Mm -hmm. It was really, really interesting for us to try to kind of rethink what the, you know, aspects of warfare might be like that the, the kind of conventional wisdom was missing. And so, you know, in this kind of gambit, we put the book out there and, and you know, tried to see how people would react. I mean, quite literally, you know, prepared that people might laugh at us for trying to, to write fiction. Um, yet what we, what we came to understand though, was that it struck a nerve, that we were able to speak to some of the greater truths that were out there about this big question of China's rise. You know, today it's a fairly you know, conventional topic when you're thinking about great power competition, et cetera, but at the time it wasn't. So then we started thinking after Ghostly, you know, what to do next. We could have written a sequel. There's a couple of scenarios we came up with that were pretty cool, but it really wasn't what was on our mind in terms of what people were missing. So when we started to look at this question of the unanswered, really the blind spots that we had um, in, in the kind of the American security community, we actually started to look inward, you know, to the U.S. and looking at the, you know, collision of forces in technology, uh, in politics, in culture, and how they were going to be transformed by this, you know, algorithmic, you know, progression in commercial society, in popular culture, et cetera, to the world that we describe in this book, Burn In, uh, where there's everyday robotics, you know, where AI and persistent data shape uh, everything in our experiences in part through augmented reality overlays. Yet we have some of the same problems that, that we're wrestling with today, you know, far right extremism, populist politicians, uh, big tech uh, colluding with some of those forces to you know, try to kind of steer the country in a path that, that not everyone is going along with. And, and what really, you know, I think struck, struck home this summer when the book came out was you know, how much of the social contract that we had spent you know, a couple of years as we were writing the book, unpacking and, and kind of looking for its fault lines, you know, were, were, were kind of laid bare in pieces, if you will, you know, during the COVID epidemic. And, and the kind of systemic risk that, that entails, the questions that it raises around how we use technology either to try to you know, heal some of those rifts or whether we you know, widen those, those, those gaps uh, are, are certainly front of mind. Now, Burn In is a story not like uh, Ghostly. It's not a war story. It's a story about an FBI agent, Laura Keegan, who has a robot partner, a first for the Bureau, and she's a counterterrorism agent hunting down uh, an anti-technology terrorist who really wants the, to kind of tear the country apart. 
And what's, what's I think, important about the book and the role that technology plays, and this is a challenge in a lot of writing, I think, about you know, the next 20 years and, and even a little bit beyond, is that many of the inventions or, or transformational uh, you know, technologies that, that are, are you know, day-to-day um, you know, pieces of, of tech that are woven into everything from like parenting, you know, uh, drones in the home to, uh, you know, persistent da- uh, surveillance and data on your own family members that you can access in, that, in the way that we, you know, might use an intelligence community today to uh, really novel use cases where, you know, you're actually putting technology into roles that society hasn't quite contemplated yet, like in, in the case of Vernon, you know, law enforcement. Um, and, you know, at the same time, you're not trying to kind of buy into the hype, right? I mean, I think there's so much, uh, you know, buzz, obviously, that gets pushed uh, into conversations about new tech. It's easy to be led a little bit astray, I think, in thinking through the human factor, which I'll, as I'll talk about, I think throughout, hopefully you'll understand it, is one of the best ways to really uh, credibly create futures that, that are, are useful. Uh, fundamentally, you know, the power of AI is, I think, one of the, you know, most uh, underappreciated in terms of its significance, you know, for all facets of society, and not necessarily in the ways that most people think. And this is just some art from Google's Deep Dream uh, image generator that I think is disturbing and fascinating. And, and often in the talks that I give, I like to use these kinds of images because it shows you we are in this kind of otherworldly like uh, era where we don't quite understand what we're creating. You know, black box AI, as they call it, is used in everything from translation technologies like Google Translate to uh, analytics that, that you know, shape uh, financial markets and, and other facets of society that are, that are absolutely critical to, to kind of a functioning system. And yet, you know, what I, what I want people to start to understand and start to appreciate is that, you know, how we live in this world is as crucial uh, to understanding what the future will be like as any one invention. And this may be my liberal arts background talking here, but I feel like it's a really valuable and important perspective that is not considered enough. That focusing too purely on technologies can lead us astray and thinking we've mastered uh, a certain kind of capability or transformation and then realizing that we've unleashed something wholly, wholly different. You know, fundamentally, uh, you know, we are at a reckoning right now about the role of, of technology, particularly data. Uh, as it represents individuals, as it represents, uh, you know, the, the value of, of large groups of society, whether we call them countries or, or, or you know, the kind of subnational, uh, you know, appellations that are, that are out there. Um, fundamentally, though, you know, data is, is, is pivotal to everything and increasingly so because of this AI revolution. Um, now, th- this quote is really important, I think. You know, Ida Tarbell was one of the muckraker journalists uh, who uh, really exposed how Standard Oil's monopoly behavior uh, with John Rockefeller was, you know, a problematic for the country and was somebody who really helped the, the nation understand this uh, facet to the American economy that, that wasn't, I think, completely understood. And, you know, this is a quote, obviously, that speaks to, uh, you know, the, the kind of her understanding of like, you know, capitalism and conflict. But, you know, you can change a couple of words in that quote. And it really strikes me as even being more apt for our moment today, especially if you think about Facebook uh, or Google as the standard oils of, you know, over 100 years ago. So the first and most imperative necessity in war is data, for data means everything else, men, guns, and ammunition. And uh, fittingly, too, that Clive Humby, the British math- mathematician, uh, who a few years ago said, you know, data is the new oil. I've often thought that data is the new ammunition, that nothing will happen in conflict without the data that is required for, uh, you know, the military action to, to take place. If we are, though, in this data rich world, if we are in this moment where, you know, technology is driving so much, how do we make sense of it? And again, this is my humanities bias probably again, but I've turned to storytelling, Uh, you know, ficant, uh, whether it's fiction intelligence or useful fiction, which is uh, a framework that is, I think, more considered and and something that that Pete and I have been working on to kind of explain is a really important way to to do so. Uh, It's one tool among many, to be clear. Uh, It's not the end all be all, but it is incredibly useful for doing everything from checking the blind spots that we have about technologies that we place a lot of faith in, whether it's you know GPS systems like Ghost Sleep talked about, warfare, uh, should the US lose access to those or over the horizon satellites, whether it's in burn-in uh, with the perils of big data and the ways that uh, extremist groups and big tech might use them to you know, shape society in ways that are not, not you know, pointing to America in the direction it needs to go. You know, it's, it's a bit tongue in cheek, this notion of ficant. I mean, it's not in, literally supposed to be an int, uh, it, but yet at the same time, finding a way to communicate within the national security community, the, the true utility of fiction, it's been very effective to, to do so. And, you know, my hope is that, that as people read more science fiction, read more future oriented fiction, 
they'll begin to you know, see the value in terms of having people understand this character-driven approach, which all good stories do. And of course, there are rules to this. Uh, and, and Pete and I recently wrote uh, an essay to this effect, which I can put a link in the chat. But what you know, we wanted people to understand is that you know, fic in, in useful fiction is as researched as any nonfiction paper, that all the rules in a story that govern real life that we experience every day, you have bad luck, there's weather, things like that. Uh, that all has to be present in these sorts of uh, fictional narratives too. It's certainly the case in Burn In where uh, we you know, go to great pains to describe the environment that our characters live in. And, and so that you have situations that are rendered real, not just because there's a lot of research that's faithful to the technologies, but that the places that we describe in Washington, DC uh, are, are in a sensory sense, you know, very closely related to what it's like to experience them today. Uh, you know, some of the other rules are, it's really important to think about effect, you know, what's the ask, you know, for those of you that write op-eds or write speeches, you know, I think this is a really important thing to always consider. And it's something that uh, with the, especially the shorter stories in, in, in the, the kind of commission sense that Pete and I have been doing for groups from, you know, NATO to uh, ACT to the, you know, Norwegian army or the British army and other groups uh, is really thinking through what's, what are you trying to communicate to the reader, right? Is it to raise questions? Is it to, you know, introduce ideas? And that I think is one of the fundamental aspects that underscores that useful uh, side to things. There, there's a great track record to this. Um, you know, obviously at the Naval War College, there is already, you know, fiction being used in courses and curriculums, uh, you know, books like Ghost Sleep, but others. The Marine Corps has been doing some great work uh, back to what the Warfighting Lab did a few years ago and a project that the Atlantic Council helped with to create a short story annex that accompanied their uh, uh, Marine Corps strategic environment forecast. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, essentially the fictional annex was downloaded in, you know, greater number than, than the actual uh, forecast itself. When you're trying to talk to a whole force, right? You're looking at the, the, the you know, 18 year old and 19 year old up to, you know, senior officers. There are a few tools better, you know, both at the cognitive, but also at the kind of creative level to engage people and finding ways to share ideas, which is increasingly challenged, especially if you're a writer uh, in a very visual media rich world. This offers a little bit of a way to hack that because our brain is very predisposed to understand narrative as a storytelling tool, often more so than, than analytics. Uh, when we are, I think, cognitively kind of overloaded by the environment we're in. There's plenty of other really good examples in the contemporary sense. We have the Krulak Center at Marine Corps University, uh, where I'm also a fellow, is uh, shepherding through, uh, now it's going to be a third volume of uh, crowdsourced, you know, grassroots graphic novels that are really effective at not only producing, you know, visual content like comics. Yes, you can read comics for work uh, that are that are asking important questions about the ethical use of technologies, the rules of war, you know, what is an adversary, big fundamental questions, but also the act of doing so is incredibly valuable to those who are involved in their communities. Because what you're able to do is essentially use a different part of your brain and kind of change that neuroplasticity to start to thinking about problems and solving them in different ways. There's a myriad other examples out there at Austrian Defense College, you know, uh, is working on this heavily under General McRyan. British government has been working on this uh, in similar efforts in, in various communities. Our own army with the Mad Scientist pro uh, Project has done incredible work on making this accessible to all, which is a big tent uh, approach that I really applaud. Um, the, you know, the, the the visual aspect of it too, of course, is, you know, can't be left out. This is some art that was commissioned uh, for a story I wrote called Arctic Night for uh, the uh, Norwegian army. And, you know, what this story, uh, you know, was about really was a reframing of what, you know, people might be fighting over in the Arctic in a different sense than what we contemplate today. You know, could a NATO member be on the sidelines between a Russia-China conflict over access to Arctic ports uh, and, and economic interests? Now, the, the visual art that goes with it is really effective because it allows the reader to kind of shortcut a little bit into the own, their own imagination of what that scene might look like. This is a Russian soldier with an exosuit. Um, but it also, when you think about how do you share your ideas, you know, in 2021, well, social media is a hugely, you know, valuable tool for that, especially if you're reaching new audiences. And so having bespoke art can be extremely effective uh, because we know how people react to content and social media, you know, visuals or everything. And so, you know, when you undertake these kinds of projects, it's really good kind of lessons learned, you know, to that. Some of the other uh, really interesting aspects of this story that I thought that I think are relevant to some of the questions about technology were the ideas of, you know, automated and autonomous commercial systems being dual purpose. You know, today we have uh, citizen soldiers uh, and, and sailors who are in reserve or guard type duties. And, you know, imagine the future that you have a UPS truck that can dual swap with a logistics role for 
you know, the force for the Norwegian army. Uh, imagine you have uh, lift capability, right? That has a similar type of like our craft fleet today, the civil reserve air fleet, uh, but on a much more smaller kind of tactical uh, level, which in Europe, you know, given the geographic distances is a much more kind of intriguing concept. You know, there's a lot that we get wrong though when we talk about technology. You know, this is one of the, the bots that came out of the consumer um, robotics boom. Incredibly popular, as you can see, uh, you know, sold out, really intriguing, a way to kind of help people understand you know, coding, understand, you know, what it's like to have kind of everyday robotics and yet not long after the startup crashed. Uh, it's, a, it's a reminder that how we predict different technologies will be relevant in the marketplace, but also I would also extend that to the strategic environment uh, is really difficult to do. And, you know, we have to remember these rules of the real, right? You know, technologies, uh, especially as we have more and more that are emerging from the civilian sector, have to hew to the rules of the market. Uh, that's often very difficult for, you know, a military analyst to understand if they aren't versed in, you know, how venture capitalists work or how, uh, you know, public equity markets, or et cetera, or even the other sovereign wealth funds invest in technologies like AI out of Russia. That's all critical to the understanding of a real uh, kind of tapestry in the landscape and being able to predict accurately, uh, if not entirely correctly, you know, what the kind of boundaries of a realistic environment in the future might be like. Gartner Analytics is one of the, you know, premier um, technology, uh, you know, consulting companies out there. They have something called the hype cycle. This is one of their older ones from 2018 that I think is actually really useful because I think you can do a similar exercise for military, militarily relevant technologies. And to be sure, all of these have uh, military applications, whether it's IoT or blockchain, et cetera. But the point is that, you know, you have essentially a way of misunderstanding technologies that can be spread quite widely. Uh, and an, an analytical exercise like this allows you to essentially slice through that a little bit, uh, whether it's hypersonic capability, you know, is there really uh, the threat environment that that is a, uh, an, poses an answer to, or is it a matter of a question that didn't need to be asked? Uh, I'm not positing one way or the other, but the point is that we have assumptions that we often take for granted that get programs of record behind them uh, that can lead to investments in, in doctrine and policy and, and let alone hardware and software. That, that may not be you know, tracking the actual progression or trend lines in, in conflict. There's other civilian tools out there like this that I think are really interesting for the world building that goes into creating these fictional worlds. Because again, everything has to be rooted in the real. And yet the ultimate and most important part is the human dimension. This is a, just a still frame from the Spike Jones film called Her, with, uh, I think, which I think describes in a really fascinating way, our relationship with technology. It's about a lonely uh, guy who writes greeting cards in a kind of futuristic type LA who falls in love with the operating system on his phone. Uh, the operating system is uh, voiced by Scarlett Johansson uh, and it's a really interesting back and forth and has a somewhat predictable end, but nonetheless, I think it shows you the future in a way at the emotional level of our relationship and of course dependence uh, on some of these on I mean, some of these technologies that we we are just starting to appreciate today. I mean, how many kids out there are, are growing up, you know, with Alexa almost as a, a family member, uh, if not obviously embodied per se, but at least playing a, a role in that discourse that goes on in everyday life. I think that's where films like this can be really really effective in trying to get us to understand, to pause, to reflect on the way that these technologies are changing our lives in, in, in manners that we can intuit, but can't quite always put our finger on. Because these are complex issues and there's of, often many different sides. Uh, this is a news clipping from uh, the summer before last about some of the economic disruption going on in Southern California. This was exactly the kind of thing we've been thinking about for Burn-In, that there are winners and losers uh, in the next decade. And Burn-In is a book that's set in the 2030s. And many of the technological and economic and social changes of the next 10 years will of course set up what happens in the 2030s. And, and that's a thesis I have, you know, essentially for America, you know, especially vis-a-vis -vis China too, that, you know, the next decade is crucial for setting up the 2030s. And by extension, I think after that, if we have big breakthroughs in tech, like I would expect around quantum computing and other facets that much of the 21st century may, may see sort of lines drawn. But to this uh, labor battle in the port of LA, it's a really interesting situation because increasing automation was you know, threatening or is threatening to upend the traditional role that labor plays in unloading ships from the port, which is one of the busiest in the world, of course, from you know, China and other uh, production centers in Asia. 
And so you have independently contracted drivers who want to move as much freight out of the port as possible. Automation is something that suits them. You know, these are 1099 workers. They are not part of unions. They are not part of, uh, you know, larger companies or independent contractors, many of them who essentially are either owning their own rigs or leasing them. And you have, you know, traditional uh, longshoremen unions who are working on behalf of uh, a system that is predicated upon a human role in what is becoming an increasingly automated process. And so they're, they are fighting it. Their equities are in, of course, this traditional approach to logistics. And so you have two sides that are pitted in a fairly intense, you know, you know, battle. I mean, not in the literal sense, thankfully. It's not quite like what we described yet in Burn In. But nonetheless, you can see the forces being arrayed that are, that are really consequential for, you know, potentially unraveling even further the American capitalist system or, you know, the economic system. And by extension, the social contract, right? The fragility that comes, uh, you know, further into the American experience is uh, going to be ushered in in many ways by these automated technologies. So when you step back and think about, you know, what are the rules then? You know, if so much is in flux, if there are so many uh, gray areas around tech, uh, you know, this is uh, from a off-road uh, rally that is called the Gambler 500. It's essentially a $500 bring a junker, you know, drive your car off-road and you know, the, the back roads of, you know, pick your state, there's chapters all over the country. What I love about it is that it really speaks to kind of the ad hocery that I think is really crucial in understanding how to use systems in engineering and design and technology uh, in ways that are probably more accurately reflect in an adversary's approach than our traditional, you know, let's create an ACAT1 program and invest trillions of dollars in it over 40 years. Um, you know, the rules of war are changing because the rules of acquisition are changing because the rules of doctrine are changing, et cetera. And I think something that is much more, you know, like this with effect, uh, these are a couple of vehicles from the gambler. Obviously, you know, people are spending a little more than $500 on their, on their rides. But the point is, you know, what you're seeing out of them, though, is a complete disregard for convention norm and ultimate, you know, focus on performance, experience, and outcome, right? Have a good time. Uh, not at all directly analogous or literally analogous or literally related to, of course, you know, the kinds of doctrine and, and, and things that we talk about in, in normal military circles, but 100% related in the kind of the spirit and the change that is ahead in how people wield technology, uh, especially this kind of junkyard hot rod, you know, uh, conflict that will be certainly not just in the sideshow of great power competition, but, but front and center. The, the human factor, again, is, is affected by all that. And you know the the messiness of this dimensionality when it comes to uh, 21st century conflict is easy to overlook. You know this is a scene from Capitol Hill in Seattle. It's the uh, Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, which was you know created this summer uh, as a you know mildly coercive experiment in kind of an anarchic space inside of America's technology hub. It's fascinating, right? This is maybe three miles from Amazon's downtown campus. Uh, I grew up in Seattle. I used to skateboard in Capitol Hill, so I know these streets really well. And, and to see this was really interesting because you, I felt like we had a glimpse of, of different systems that are trying to coexist uh, in, at the same time, and they're, they're having less and less uh, success in doing so. And these kinds of risks, I think, are crucial in thinking through the way that we try to understand the future of warfare. You know, when Pete and I wrote Burn In, which is a book about, of course, a, con a civil conflict and a civil tension in America that comes from this unraveling of the social contract caused by technology and automation, there's massive questions about kind of who will be able to determine that future. And it seems ironically that the more algorithmic and kind of software we have in this experiment, you know, that is the American system, the harder it really gets to control. Uh, you can see that in the Uprising last week in the Capitol, you can see the ability to target individuals uh, to get the to do things together on mass, which speaks to almost a cognitive, you know, domain in warfare or something even beyond that, a human domain that I think is going to be incredibly important for military organizations and security organizations to understand uh, because the, the rules of conflict are changing quicker than we're able to adapt to. All that to say that, you know, I think one of the best ways, of course, as this Frederick Pohl quote you know, illustrates is, you know, we have to, I think, turn to narrative to help to help do that, the complexity of it, the human factor, uh, the understanding that there are rules that are, that, are, that are being broken and rewritten by those who usually don't do so becomes incredibly important to figuring out what to do about all this. So in that spirit, I'm happy to, uh, to answer some questions uh, for the balance of the time. And I really, again, appreciate your, your time today.